Hi, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Dennis Houlihan. I'm the president of Solus Nua. I'm, we're thrilled to be here with all of you tonight uh, for this conversation about you know, new, uh, new Irish my, uh, writing with Alice McDermott, Mike McCormick, and Sarah Davis Goff. Uh, before we begin, I would just like to give you some thanks and get you an idea about how this came about. There are a lot of people that aren't here tonight that were critical of bringing this together. First, we have a terrific partner in New York City, the Irish Arts Center in New York City. If you go to New York, I highly encourage you to look at what they're, what they're up to. We have a regular conversation, uh, Solus Neo here in Washington and the Irish Arts Center. And from that conversation, uh, our enthusiasm about Mike and Sarah's work led to, well, you know, he's coming. Maybe we can bring him down. And maybe we can bring them both down. And here we are tonight, which is just a wonderful way to show a partnership of our two cities. Uh, of course, we needed a, a space to do this. The first place one goes to is right here. Uh, New York University, DC has been a wonderful partner for us. If you, we've done all kinds of programming here with them. We've done a wonderful art show here in the lobby, uh, in the two lobbies. We've had film, we've had uh, musical performances, and we look forward to many things going on again. They're just terrific to work with. Our friends at the Embassy of Ireland uh, helped us tonight uh, when you had the particularly uh, when you had the, uh, the, the good food up there. That was a, a contribution from our, our friends at the Embassy of Ireland who, are, who have been, some of you just recently saw perhaps our play about Frederick Douglass. I want to give it a shout out to the Embassy for that. The Department of Foreign Affairs of the Irish government was very, very supportive of that, of that production and helped us put it on. Also, this is the European Union Month of Culture. Uh, and so the European Union and their cultural division put out a lot of the word about this. And then finally, um, institutionally, I like to, if you're not familiar with but Cultural Ireland, Cultural Ireland is the agency in the Irish government that, that helps send Irish artists to uh, around the world and has become a very important partner for us. We wouldn't be able to, have, to offer you this Irish artist that you're seeing tonight without the support of, our, of Cultural Ireland in terms of paying for their transportation and lodging and things like this. So it's a very, these, you can see it's a, it's a whole group that we've been working together now for a number of years to bring this sort of art here. And then I also I want to thank, I'm looking across the audience, I see a lot of supporters of, that support us financially at Solus New and I truly appreciate that because while the others cover a lot, there's always more to cover. Um, so with that, I just want to, uh, introduce briefly our, our moderator for the evening, who is a terrific friend of Solus Nua uh, and, and, and my own, uh, Alice, Alice McDermott. Uh, many of you know Alice, Alice's work. Her current novel, The Ninth Hour, was a finalist for the National Book uh, Critics Circle Award and the Kirkus Prize for Fiction. Uh, she's written a number of novels. She's been in a, uh, her book, Charming Billy, won the National Book Award. Uh, I was beyond thrilled when I turned to Alice, I think, at a reception and said, Alice, would you, would you consider doing an interview with, for us with uh, Mike McCormick and Sarah Davis? Uh, and her enthusiasm was almost threw me off my chair. She's, yes, yes, that'd be great. And I was like, wow, because I've seen Alice with Ron Charles from the Washington Post in this service setting, and it was, it's just phenomenal. If you get a chance to, well, you'll see tonight for yourself, but if you get a chance to see <laughs> the two of them together, it's a, it's a good, it's a very good uh, uh, piece as well. Uh, in addition to her own writing, uh, Alice is a professor of, uh, of the uh, Richard Maxke Professor of Humanities at John Hopkins University, and always open to my suggestion telling her, Alice, you know about this new writer I just heard about from Ireland? You know, do you think that maybe they could come to Hopkins or she'll have suggestions to us? And so it's another part of our partnership that makes Solus New a fun place to work. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Alice and we'll take the rest of the evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. Um, I love hyperbole. <laughs> Keep it coming. Thank you. Um, and thank you all for being here. And um, thank you, Sarah and Mike. Um, uh, Mike was uh, gracious enough to um, serve as my interviewer um, when I was in Galway a few months ago. Um, so part of my enthusiasm when Dennis uh, mentioned this was uh, a chance to repay in kind um, and also to um, 
not talk about my own work, but to get a chance to talk to Mike a bit about more about his. Um, but I'm going to begin with uh, Sarah Davis Goff, who is uh, Mike's publisher, um, and I'm I'm not used to being a moderator or an introducer, so um, forgive me for the rustling of the pages. Um, in 2014, Sarah Davis Goss and Lisa Cohen founded Tramp Press, an independent publisher based in Dublin and dedicated to the proposition that, quote, there's always a place for brilliant literature and the burden is on publishers to find great works and to put them in the hands of people who will love them. Since its inception, Tramp Press has done just that, uh, putting into the hands of this particular reader, uh, Sarah Baum's marvelous first novel, Spill, Simmer, Falter, Wither, which I highly recommend if you haven't seen it. Uh, Dubliners 100, a collection of new stories inspired by you know who's original. Uh, stories by the likes of Brenda McKeon, Mary Morrissey, Donald Ryan, and a wonderful teaching tool, I must say. Um, and of course, uh, the brilliant Mike McCormick's novel, Solar Bones. Through its series, uh, Rediscovered Voices, Tramp Press has also given new life to writers who work has, whose work has been lost, forgotten, or put aside. Thus far, the titles in this series includes The Uninvited by Dorothy McArdle. Some of you may remember the Ray Milan movie. Uh, Charlotte Riddle's A Struggle for Fame, and Maeve Kelly's story collection, which I'm reading right now, Orange Horses. Uh, so welcome, Thank Sarah. you so much. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. I'm not sure if this is a popular thing to say here, but this is DC just like much nicer than New York. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. That's very. Popular. I can see the sky. It's pretty. I'm liking it. Thank you so much for having me. It's such a pleasure to be here. It is a real pleasure. Thank you. <laughs> As a native New Yorker, I'm, you're allowed uh -oh. to say that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm giving you my permission. Thank you. <laughs> um, all right, Sarah. I just want to start with. Um, the naming of things. Um, can you talk a little bit about why you and Lisa chose to name your publishing company Tramp Press? Sure. So I wanted to call it Growler, um, which is a dirty word in Ireland. Um, but uh, Lisa said no. And we wanted to call it something that was um, a little bit of a reference to sort of an outsider. I think if, if there's something that, that our taste has in common, it's that we, we really like perspectives from, from those that are not often presented in, in fiction or in any art. Um, so it, um, we're both sort of fans of um, the playwright Singh. Um, and Singh has a habit of introducing a sort of tramp figure into a domestic um, situation to kind of shake it up. And, and we really like the idea of, of being something that sort of, you know, shakes up a stale patriarchy, ideally. And it's also a bit of a reference to um, other publishers we like, um, like Virago um, and Jezebel. It's a bit of a sort of reclamation of the word. Mm -hmm. So, so how do you um, find the hubris in 2014 <laughs> in Ireland? Um, to start an independent publisher? Sheer bloody mindedness, I think. <laughs> um, there are a few things going on. So Lisa and I had both worked in publishing for a long time, um, and we met while we were working for a small independent press called uh, the Lilliput Press, um, which is just based in Dublin's north side, um, which is lovely. Um, and I think no matter how great the job is that you have, you're always sort of thinking, well, what would I do a little bit differently in a totally ideal world? And Lisa and I were just joking one day, and one of us said, oh, well, you know, when we have our own company, you know, this is how we'll manage things. And it just got quite serious very quickly. So it started half as a joke, but looking around us, it, had, it felt like there is a need for a slightly fresh perspective on, um, on publishing. Um, having worked for so long in the industry, we saw some habits that we really disliked um, for example, publishers are inclined to sign up a lot of writers and then sort of throw them all against a wall and hope that you know one of them sticks and becomes a huge success. And that is unkind to the writers um, and not great for not great for literature in the larger sense, I think. So we wanted to slightly turn that on its head and have um, just a few books a year and then really you know devote just all of our resources, all of our time and attention to them and just you know try and make sure that they stuck. So 
Apart from that, um, there is also a bit of a lack of diversity in just the, the decision makers of who who is making the decisions of, of you know what books would actually end up on shelves. And um, if it's only you know men in their sixties and seventies that are making this decision, that's not not totally ideal. So <laughs> providing a little Nothing bit of against men in their sixties <laughs> and seventies. Oh, absolutely not. But I think we all know that if there's only one um, like distinct type of person <laughs> making, um, I'm coming for you, um, making. Um, <laughs> If there's only one type of person making decisions about art and what art is, then it's not really art that's being represented. It's something slightly different. So we wanted to to we wanted to see what else could be done. Mm -hmm. Are you still the only the only female editor? Is it? The only female editors in Dublin, though, at the moment, still oh, are you? Um, in terms of pu like actual book publishers, I think we are, but there are lots of great journals in Dublin, and um, yeah. so there are great editors like um, Susan Tomaselli, who runs Gorse Literary Journal, um, and the women at Banshee are brilliant as well. So there's actually lots going on. Yeah. yeah. But no other female heads of publishing houses. Is um, that right? I actually believe there's a publisher called Gill um, that I believe they just had a, a, a switch over of, um, of MD recently, and I believe that might be a woman now. So I'm not totally sure. We can hope. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> fingers crossed. We live in hope. <laughs> um, I read somewhere uh, another thing that, um, that was involved in the naming and, and that, that you recognized with your uh, affection for Singh mm -hmm. um, is that reanimation of a corpse that, yeah. that Singh <laughs> likes to do <laughs> yeah. or has been known to do in his plays. Irish literature is full of zombies. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and you're in DC, so <laughs> we have some of them here too. <laughs> okay. um, but so that, that whole idea of uh, not only publishing new work, but mm -hmm. reviving um, work that um, has, as, you, uh, as you've said, has been forgotten or mm -hmm. put aside um, for your series. Um, how do you go about recognizing um, who's dead enough? <laughs> you know, yeah. um, sure. who who, um, who can you revive and also convince readers right. to take a good look at? So um, in our Recovered Voices series, where we find um, writers who have written brilliant work um, and for no good reason have just sort of been forgotten in the sands of time, um, we, our criteria are a little bit fuzzy. All we have to do really is read something that is out of print and absolutely love it. Um, and so we get quite a lot of recommendations. If any of you have recommendations for something that's out of print, um, like send it on to us. We'd be really fascinated to see. Um, and so we get quite a few submissions um, for the series um, throughout the year, and we just sort of read through them, you know, by hook or by crook. We get our hands on an old, old an old edition of it, um, and then it's about finding a contemporary academic to who knows the author particularly well or knows the work, and we ask that academic to just set the stage for the work and talk about the context and talk about the life of the person involved. Um, so yeah, we're a little fuzzy. We just find stuff that we like and then we put it out and hope for the and best. And there's no criteria for era or um, they have to be dead for any no, <laughs> authors in fact, have to be um, dead. No, in fact, Maeve Kelly, for example, he wrote Orange Horses is still with us, which is, which is great. And it has been lovely to be able to celebrate the work of, a st of an artist who is still alive. So that has been really nice. Um, but um, no, just, it has to be out of print and, and under-deserved, I mean, under-loved. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a quote, actually, um, in the introduction that Simon Workman wrote for um, Maeve Kelly's Orange Horses um, that I had to read a number of times. Um, he wrote, uh, though the number of published Irish women writers increased in the 1970s and early 1980s, only one in 10 Irish books printed during this period were authored by women. And this ratio drops to one in 50 when considering mainstream, non-women oriented presses. Um, clearly, this must be in your mind in both founding the press and finding the writers, um, whether you're, you're a non-woman oriented press or not. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And I, I in some ways, we've come so far. I mean, certainly more than one in 50 book published now is by a woman. But I opened up the Sunday Times, for example, um, last weekend. The Sunday Times is one of you know the big, the big newspapers, the big Sundays um, at home. And I looked through the reviews. There was not a single review of a book by a woman. There was not a single reviewer on those pages that was a woman. It was by men, for men. And that's where we are still. So nothing against men except for we want a little bit more of that space, please. That's all. 
I'll, I'll get my coat. <laughs> 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 And yet you also let men in, such as the great. <laughs> I mean, you have to be particularly great, I would say. And, um, and Mike is also feminist and awesome, so that's a joy to publish, actually. So, so we'll, we'll get Mike's version of the story next, but um, can you talk about how uh, Solar Bones came to Tramp Press and, and how you brought it uh, to the rest of us. It was a really good day. Um, <laughs> it's, I think uh, well, you get into publishing because there's a feeling that you're chasing. Um, and that feeling is of cracking open a book for the first time and just being utterly swept away by it. And for us, that happens really rarely. It's another reason that we only publish three books a year. I, just, I don't think any of us probably find that feeling very often. But every now and then, it happens. And so my business partner, Lisa, and I were fans of Mike since we were teenagers, really. And when we were talking about setting up Trap Press, I mean, he was one of the authors that we talked about um, that you know, we'd one day love to have grow into publishing, um, and so we kind of hassled his agent for a really long time, saying, "What's Mike working on? How about now?" <laughs> and she eventually um, sent us on a manuscript, and we devoured it and loved it right away. I mean, I, I imagine quite a lot of you in the audience have read Solar Bones already, um, and if you haven't, you're in for a treat. Um, but I mean. Oh, that, those first three pages. I mean, it's like a new language, and then three pages in, you've learned that language, and you're just in this, this world and this universe, and it's a glorious read. So, yeah, stalking, light stalking is how we get our books. <laughs> <laughs> and when you say you were fans since you were teenagers, um, were you the intern who wrote a summary of, was it Mike's first novel? Oh, no, it wasn't Mike's first novel, but it was, I wrote a summary of Forensic Songs, uh -huh. which Lilliput eventually okay. published. Hmm. I think I, I think Anthony showed me that. Um, it's probably terrible. I'm mortified. No, be like, this is no, good. no, it was a lovely. Written was, in crayon. He, <laughs> he was very pleased with it. He he, he wrote the he wrote the uh, you wrote the reader's report and gave it to him, and he ran with it. Then he was very taken with it and that, um, and uh, yeah. So that's that was our first that was our first uh, meeting with with each other. Mm -hmm. um, and I what year would that have been? <sighs> Forensic songs came out in t forensic songs came out in two twelve. So yeah, it was about it was about the end of two ten mm -hmm. because that 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 uh, that that would have happened because um, Lilliput were a bit slow moving at the time on that and and uh, but that was when it happened. But I think she sells the, the, the I think that she's selling the story of 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 coming across um, mm -hmm. solar bones. I think she sells a li little bit short there because it was it, it was. It, 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 from my end, it's much more kind of dynamic and and went on a lot longer. I I I I sent the book to I sent finished the book at two thirty in the morning and I sent it sent it off to my agent. And I got into the car then seven or eight hours later, and went in to Galway Hospital and we became myself and Maeve we became parents. So yes. So the the book is exactly the same age as as, as my my little boy, so I I I had something else on my mind for the next three or four months, and when I when I raised my head when I raised my head above water, then uh, uh, three or four months, I asked my the agent, asked, uh, Mariana, said, "How's this going? You know, is anyone interested in the book on that?" And she says, you know, she says everyone loves it. They think it's great, but no one wants to publish it. Uh, because they said, they said, um, there's the usual thing with you, Mike. They, they look, they say you're going to get great reviews, and everyone's going to be nod, nod and, and sit, re say respectful things about it, but it's not going to sell. And she says already we've had, she said, I had two, two editors at one at Faber and one at Fourth Estate who've brought it to acquisitions meetings, and who have tried to make passionate cases for the book, but they. And they've been listened to, and, the, and then the accountant says, well, that's all very good, but look at these figures. And um, they have access to these Nielsen figures, which shows all the figures of your sales for your previous books. This is our strength. We can't afford those. So. <laughs> <laughs> you, didn't, you didn't know those calamitous figures, did you? Yeah. <laughs> So they so so that so that's it. Once once they start once the accountants start pointing at figures, that's it. It's game over. So, but there was a few other publishers. There's a few other publishers then that she had to sell that she wanted to send it to as well. And that went on and on all through the summer and everything. And and even my even my old publisher re rejected it in that they couldn't make head nor tail of it in that. 
And it, so it had nowhere else to go. To this day, Marianne will not tell me how many publishers <laughs> rejected it and that. But she said, look, she, in the meantime, we'd been watching. I'd, I'd watch what Tram Press had done. And they were, they, they just had cut a swathe through the idea of Irish publishing. Here they come. They were only published a couple of books. And they had, already they were getting reviews in The Guardian. And they were getting reviews in, in The Sunday Times and that. And no other Irish publisher was getting these things and that. And then they brought out Una Frawley's book. And just the look of the book, the feel of it, everything about it was very different to what was being done. It was a beautiful edition full of very high production values and that. And they, and they, brought, out, they brought out Flight right in the teeth of the recession. This beautiful book, beautiful edition and that. It was, it was kind of counterintuitive that they poured loads into production values and that. And of course, people went for it because it was beautiful. Uh, and not just a fine book novel and that, but it was a beautiful, it was an object of desire itself and that. But anyways, they, uh, the book, my own book had nowhere else to go. So Marianne says, I'm so flattered. <laughs> I know that. Yeah, you, you didn't know this either at the day. But he says, let's let's send it to let's send it to to Trump Press. He said, I really like what they're doing. They're they're very vibrant in that. So I sent the book off to them and and um, and I got a got an email back two three weeks later and it says, we're coming to Galway. We'd like to we'd like to talk to you about your manuscript. So I said, fine. So we met in a restaurant down uh, out in Sea Road. And um, they sat me down and they bought me a bowl of soup, and they <laughs> they proceeded to uh, and uh, they proceeded to talk for ten fifteen minutes about the book, and I knew that the book had found its proper home. Um, these people, these two women, met it head on, and they just they understood it, they accepted it, they had a reading of it that was so much more involved than my own in many ways and that. And they saw so many more things in it. They pointed out a couple of things that, that, that I was susceptible to, one or two repetitions that could have been done without and everything. But they just went for And one of the things that got me about what they said was everything that everyone else had pissed and moaned and whined about in the book, they said, no, 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 we can go. No, that's brilliant. We can go with that. All that long, unbroken sentence thing that's going on. No, that's brilliant. We can go with that. All that engineering stuff that's, oh, that's great. We can go with that. And that all quiet, domestic stuff, all that. Oh, we can, there's an audience for that. And he says, we can sell this book. We can sell this book. And he says, we, we have a, it's, we're firm in our belief that the, that the publishing industry is, is, is underestimating readers. And so I went home that night, and I spoke to Maeve, and I spoke to Marianne, and I says, these two women, they understood the book. I think that they, I says, let's, let's do a deal with them. And that was it. And uh, one of the things that, that's forgot is about, about is that it only took about eight months from that moment to the publication of the book and that, which is, that's pretty, pretty sharpish. I think the turnover in Britain is about, what, 15, 16 months or something like that's that? That's right, or two years even, yeah. Or two mm. years even. And we, um, yeah, I think the manuscript is sort of in great shape, um, and we sort of pride ourselves on being quite light on our feet and just being able to, to move forwards with something when we need to. And we just, um, yeah, we wanted to bring it out as quickly as possible and just sort of shock and awe people with, the, with, with its brilliance. Yeah, we were just excited, overexcited. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Mike. S Solar Bones is a, is a book um, you have to read. Um, and I asked Mike if he would mind um, just reading a section for us. And while he's doing that, I will take advantage of um, the introduction Dennis asked me to write <laughs> and say that Mike has written two collections of short stories, <laughs> Getting in the Head and Forensic Songs, and three novels, Notes from a Coma, Crow's Requiem, and Solar Bones. Getting It in the Head won Ireland's Rooney Prize for Irish Literature. Notes from a Coma was shortlisted for the Irish Book of the Year. And Solar Bones won the Goldsmiths Prize, was named Novel of the Year by the Irish Book Awards, also won the Eastern Book Club Prize, and was long listed for the Booker. Uh, thank, thank you. I, um, the book concerns itself with uh, an engineer, a middle-aged engineer called Marcus Conway. And, um, and the book is only an hour long. It's, it's, uh, it's, it takes place between the Angelus Bell, which uh, in, our public broadcaster, what's the public broadcaster? Is it NBC? What, what's the? 
PBS, okay. Uh, okay, imagine if PBS in the middle of, at 12 o'clock has an Angelus bell. That, that's what happens in Ireland at 12 o'clock. Our national broadcaster broadcasts the Angelus bell. It's part of the, it's just part of the, the, the kind of, it's a moment in the day that we, that we all recognize. And then at one o'clock, there is the time signal for the main news in the middle of the day, which is the, the, the news. So we have the, this book is cast between these two temporal markers, one the divine marker, which is the Angelus bell, and the other the temporal marker, which is the news, the signal for the one o'clock news in that. So this whole book is just an hour long. But in that hour, this man, Marcus Conway, he remembers his whole life. And uh, his life as an engineer, his life as a father, his life as a, as a son. And one of the things he remembers fondly is his father. And his father was a, f a farmer, small farmer, a fisherman. And he, he was a man who knew with no arrogance, but just knew his place in the world and stepped lightly through the world and confidently through the world and that. And he was a source of good counsel to, source of wisdom and good counsel to his son, Marcus. But then his wife dies, Ani, Marcus's mother's die, and this is what happens to, this is what happens to uh, Marcus's father. And it must have been that same sort of unspooling, coupled with the fatal aptness for fantasy that consumed my father and unraveled his mind in the last year of his life, especially during those last, year, last months when he lost his grip on the world completely and he withdrew to the old house where there was only himself and the dog to keep each other company in those days after Ronnie's death. The long winter nights when the full weight of her absence must have come upon him with so much fear and loneliness that his grief was eclipsed completely in disbelief at the fact that his wife of over 40 years could ever leave him for any reason whatsoever, death included. Leave him all alone now, a fate he'd never envisioned nor prepared himself for so that when it did come, the raw shock of it scrambled his sense of the world so thoroughly it was as if something essential to the proper balance of the universe itself had been casually set aside and replaced with some new but shoddy circumstance which so keenly insulted something delicate within him that in no time at all, all his strength and resolve was undone and he slackened and lost interest in the world before withdrawn completely to the house with the dog where in the half light of those narrow rooms behind drawn curtains his confusion and his grief deepened to that fatal awkwardness which, which there is no talking to, so that very soon he grew angry and rancorous, and he fell out with myself and Edna, took against us with such sudden vehemence in those weeks after Ronnie's funeral that we'd no time to fathom its proper cause, but we were nonetheless left in no doubt by his rage that some shameful blame had accrued to both of us for some reason or other because when we went to see him, he dismissed us from behind the closed door, telling us to leave and to not come back and calling us a shower of cunts and nothing but. His curse upon us that day, both of us standing there looking at each other in disbelief and not knowing what to do. And when I took a walk around the house, I saw that he had the curtains drawn in every window and the back door was locked and there was no way in, so there was nothing for it but to leave. We'd come back, we'd try again in another couple of days. But then he sold off all his livestock and hens and leaving them just himself then and Rex alone in the house now and the two gates coming into the yard barred as well, secured with two box of timber tied from pillar to pillar so that the postman, he had to climb up over the sod fence and walk down the path to shove the letters and the mass card under the door which was bolted. And all this happened before Annie's month's mind mass by which time he'd begun to show the first signs of letting himself go, growing a beard that bristled out from his jaws in a way that threatened to engulf his whole head, a shock in sight on a man who'd been clean-shaven his whole life, but who now, he wouldn't hear a word against this beard, saying that his father had had a beard, and his father before him had had one, and so too had our Lord, apparently, a better man than either of them, and if a beard was good enough for these men, it was good enough for him also, and that was an end to it just as it most certainly marked the point at which he really did begin to neglect himself. Not eaten right and no wash or shave either. And the same clothes on him day in, day out, while he grew thinner and thinner inside them with the shirt slack over his narrow chest and the trousers barely hanging on his hip. But the hair and the beard still growing, thickening around like a furze bush around his head. 
no fire or heat on in the house anymore, so that it got damp and filthy with black mould groaned on the walls, and nothing but the smell of piss meeting me at the door the few times he let me in to see him with a few bits and pieces from, and I found him sitting there in the dark, all alone in the glare of a television screen, looking at Bosco or some other kid's programme, and a can of fly spray on the table. And one evening he fell asleep in front of the open fire, sods burning and coals falling onto the hearth. And he woke up to find his Wellington soldered to his feet, melted in the feet or, melted around his ankles. And he'd have been in serious trouble only he had a good wool sock on under them. And he managed to hobble to the kitchen table where he got out the bread knife and he cut them away. Socks and trousers and Wellingtons lying in a heap in the middle of the floor and the smell of burnt rubber thick in the air as I stood appalled in the murk of that room and I said, you can't live like this. Like what? Like this, the state of the place. You'd know how I should live. Well, I know there has to be something better than this. And I saw a look come over his face, which stopped me. I saw her last night, he said. You saw who? Annie, I saw Annie. Oh, Jesus Christ, Dad, mama has been dead for months. And I woke up last night and she was standing at the end of the bed and she was looking at me. And she had two bags of shopping with her. And do you know what she said? She's dead, Dad. I know it's hard. She said, go over. Go over and see the state of that grave I'm lying in. I've told you before, we've been through this. You cannot put a headstone on that grave yet. You have to give the time, ground time to settle. 11 months to a year. That's the usual waiting time. <coughs> and now his eyes were brimming as his heart was broken, as if his broken heart had opened up some spring which flowed up through him, and I'm standing there alone in the kitchen light, the dog out eating the grass along the margins of the road. And sometimes, if you were passing, you'd see him at the gable of the house, leaning on the stick and smoking, and watching the cars going to town in the evening. But if you stopped to talk to him over the fence, he'd take off like a frightened hen, and you'd hear him pulling the bolts on the door from the road, and you could imagine him sitting there alone, in the wane and light of the kitchen, watching the television, wasting away in confusion and neglect while winter closed in around him. And the television stayed on, but the bulbs started to go out in one room after another as doors were closed for the last time on those same rooms with bottles and unread newspapers piling up on the chairs and the dresser and the sofa under the window, while all around him, the house gradually came apart with paint peeling and curtains rain, and the doors swelled in their frames from the dampness. I'll leave it there. <laughs> I think that was, I think that was a kind of a live out the country, and I suppose I've seen so many men become completely undermined by grief. Men, strong men, who are just at a, find themselves um, completely taken by surprise by death, by the death. Of, I, I know it happened in my own family. My, my, I lived with my grandfather for a couple of months after his. Uh, after uh, a couple of months after uh, Granny died, and he was always coughing and spluttering and wheezing, and she was always full of life and singing and everything, and she was the one that died. She just got a heart attack one day on the side of the street in Westport, and she was probably dead before she hit the ground. And um, but he just came, he just came apart in a way that was just undone by grief in a way that was I, w I would never have. I don't think I'd ever have guessed at if I hadn't seen it myself on that. And I've seen, you know, lost my dad myself when, when I was 15, so I've seen my mother grieving in that. But I don't think I've ever saw anyone so dismantled as, as, as I did, I think, my, my grandfather. He just kind of, I, I, I don't know if you can will yourself to death, but, you, but I'd say, it's, say something like that nearly happened. And he only lived 11 months after that himself. And that. So all those things, they go into the, the book isn't autobiographical, it's autobiographical only in that it's, it's actually set exactly where I say it's set. The, the light, the roads, the journey, the roads that he drives on, the exact place where the book ends up, that exists and it exists for the purpose that I say it exists. Um, so those are the, the autobiographical aspects of that book and that. Have you ever travelled that road? Do you, do, do, do you know I don't know. Lisa, my business partner, knows it full well. She's, she's from that area as well, but I don't, I'm afraid, no. Yeah, okay. She often says that there's a, there's a particular lay-by that um, features in the book, and Lisa knows, she, she says she knows that well, too. Yeah, it, it was, it was, that, that does exist. 
and it exists for it exists for the reason I say it exists. And in my lifetime, two men have pulled in there for the exact reason that I say they pulled in as well. Yeah. Uh, you that, said that some quietened you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Stay away from the laybys. <laughs> Keep driving. <laughs> Um, I've heard you say a couple of times about um, how uh, composing Solar Bones was sort of like taking dictation from Marcus yeah. Conway. Um, just he was a great companion. Uh, he's a man of the world. He's a father. He's a husband. He's a lover. Um, he's an engineer. Um, and you just sort of, um, I think you've talked about just sort of listening to him and talking to him and, and taking down his voice. Yeah, and I'm glad you draw attention to that as well. You properly said that he was a man of the world. He, he, he. That's what I liked about him was that he's he he is a complete adult involvement with the world. He's son, father, brother, engineer. He's had a brush with politics. He knows how to politic because he's learned it at the feet of the masters and that. And uh, he has a brush with religion and he has a brush with art. So he's he has this complete involvement with the world that I found completely enthralling. And yes, I, uh, I often, he, 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 was, he must have been really good company, because I don't ever remember being bored by him. But that said, I don't remember anything about the writing of the book. And, and I, I mean this quite literally. I don't remember writing the book. I've written five books, and four of them I can tell you everything about them. But you know, and I, I can point out all the places where I, where all the small victories and all the major failures and everything like that and all the hassle I had. But I don't remember writing that much about, I don't remember writing Solar Bones and it was only when an, uh, another interviewer asked me about it. And partially I think, because I, partially because I, because as you say, I took dictation, uh, you know, I mightn't have wrote it at all for all I know. I just, just, I'm still kind of, I'm still worried that, that you know, in, in, on an occasion like this, someone's going to burst into the room and say, you stole my book, you fucker. <laughs> yeah, and you know, someone's going to claim that it's their book and, and not my book. And really all I have is, 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 is a collection of files and, and notes at home that gradually gravitate towards this book. But I certainly have no, personal memory. One of the things that I have no memory reason is because my child rose up between me and the book on the, on the morning of it. And, and as one critic or one person says, he rose up like the full stop that's not in the book, yeah. put an end to the book completely in my imagination and that. And, um, but one, one of the reasons is, is and again, there's another interviewer put it, that the book is so flowing and riverine that it just completely passed through me and it was gone. And that, and, and and the voice belongs so completely to him that that in many ways I didn't, I don't have any. I often say that it's a, it's an it's a novel of ideas as, as well. But if it's a novel of ideas, I don't seem to have given it much thought in some way. <laughs> so, <laughs> so so all of those things went into the into the composition of it. Yeah. But so that, so after having that experience, that completely immersive experience, immersing yourself so fully in this voice that um, you come out the other end and feel you hadn't actually written it, you just transcribed it. Um, what, what is the editing process then like? What happens when an editor from Tram Press um, brings her voice to, to, the, to well, the work? Yeah, I, I, this was, you, I always figured, feel that, that I, I see the editor as the enemy. And, and, <laughs> no, I, 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 bear with me a second. I, I, I genuinely think that it is my job to present them with a manuscript. And they read it, and they say, my work here is done. But I've never achieved that. Okay, I work to, I, I, don't, I don't consult anyone, I don't, I don't give out any work to anyone while the work is on ongoing, and I work it to what I think is the finished thing. And then I, then Maeve reads it, and Maeve comes back and she says, yeah, it's good. It needs a shave and a shampoo, but it, it's, uh, it's pretty clean, and um, it's good enough, to give to a, good enough to give to a publisher. So when I gave it, so when I gave it to Tramp Press, I had it pretty, I had pretty spent a long time um, it had gone through a lot of rinse cycles and that. But, but it's not flawless. 
And so when I knew that it was susceptible, as I am as a person, and in the way I go about my life and the way I teach, I'm susceptible to repetition. Um, and that is a good thing in this book. Part of the part of the progress of this book is this kind of looping sort of riverine continuance that sometimes loops back on itself. And um, it's, it's, uh, it's kind of circular in spots, but it keeps moving forward in that. But one of, one of the pitfalls of that is two types of repetition, good repetition and bad repetition. Good repetition means that it's that you pick up and renew an old rhythm, an old idea, and that, or you pick up and renew an old place or consideration, and that's the good repetition. And the bad repetition is just dead repetition. It's just, it's just a, a mechanical repetition of those things without a adding anything new to them, uh, or, or worse, to, the, to contradicting yourself or misplacing yourself. So a susceptible, the book, is the manuscript was susceptible to a small bit of that, and this is where, and this is where the question you asked. It, in, it was Lisa's, it was Lisa's and Sarah's job to come in and to and to uh, to see that because you you know yourself, you you read uh, as a writer, you read you read what what should be there rather than what is there. A time comes in a manuscript where you read what should be there rather than what is, is there. So I found it easy. And one of the things I found, just as a further thing, I, I, I've published, I've published with, with four or five publishing houses, uh, British and American and that, and all good people, uh, all very skillful in that. But this is the first time that I sat down with, a, with uh, two Irish editors and that. And the degree to which I didn't have to translate the book and explain the book to them was extraordinary. It was, that was a really, really extraordinary experience. I didn't have to explain what Mairn was. I didn't have to explain what the GAA was. I didn't have to explain who this, that. And the next thing the fell in the white suit was, they just knew it straight away. And I've been in, I've been in the, in the random house building in, in London where, where, and you know, I'm, I'm dealing with Oxford and Cambridge graduates, really smart people, but they're, they have a different tuning. They have a different, they have a different inner ear. And, and you, you, what came, came to me is just how readily we fall into this translation mode. And, um, and I didn't have to do that at Tramp Press, and that was extraordinary. So at the moment, there is a thing happening in Irish publishing. It's a really great time to be a young Irish writer, because it's more than likely that you're going to get a serious editorial tuning by either Sarah and Lisa, or uh, the lady at Gorse, or, or um, Declan uh, at, at The Stinging Fly all really gifted. It's t spoken about at the moment that there's a gifted generation of Irish writers, but there's a g gifted, equally g gifted generation of Irish editors at the moment. And it's, no, it's, no, it's not a coincidence that the last five, six, seven years has seen more experimental writing being published by Irish writers than, than uh, in years previous than that. That's just to get away from you. You were going to ask uh, Lisa or uh, Sarah about the about the editorial process well, yeah, of my book. From 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 the the, the other side of it, um, when you know that you've got a manuscript that um, the, the the voice is um, has completely taken over the writer, that the writer or or that belongs so thoroughly mm. to the writer, um, how do you approach it with? Um, tweaks and, mm -hmm. and suggestions. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's, you're getting at the, the very DNA um, yeah. of, of the book and the writer. I think so much happens actually in that first meeting that you have with a writer where you sit down with the manuscript and you talk about what it is and what it's trying to achieve and the world it is, 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 it is existing in and whether or not you understand that world and you've come at it from the right perspective. And I think if you are if you haven't as a publisher, then you're not the right publisher for that book. So much of that first meeting is about um, making sure that, and it's just establishing that you have the same vision for what the, the absolute you know, finished manuscript will look like. Um, so it's never, it's hopefully editing is never about sort of a tug of war or a fight um, about quality. It's about refining and, and um, bringing things on just a step further. Um, it's, it's hopefully not about fighting, it's about um, 
tweaking so that the great things about this manuscript come even more alive and the characters sing a little bit louder and um, and the pips land a little bit harder. Um, and uh, another thing I've experienced as an editor is that it's only ever bad writers that resist editorial feedback, to be honest. The great ones are always like, yeah, give me more of this, please. Um, and Mike, of course, being a dream to work with, was just very into the editorial process and really wanted to work with with us. And, you know, it was a, really a shared vision, which is what it should be, ideally. Yeah, mm. I mean, it's... it's um, no, I was glad. I, 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 I was... Um, yeah, bugs getting... I, ha I hadn't really had any editorial oversight at... at, at at uh, at Cape, um, I had a brave. You're out I had a brave. I had a brave editor at Cape, uh, but didn't do much line editing. And a couple of repetitions, the bug of repetition had got into my prose, and that, and um, I hadn't seen it. And uh, so that was the that was the one thing that that uh, that was that was the the one thing I was so glad for your eye. And there's just one scene in which there's a very slight but significant change in it and that and that's the only the story is exactly the same everything else is exactly the same in the book it's just that it's kind of like a final rinse cycle that you put the book through to get to get the soap out of it <laughs> and for us i'd say that as a publisher we publish so little we publish so hard that if there wasn't a manuscript that we were sort of 97 percent there with i'm not sure it'd be right for us we're not really about heavy interference i suppose yeah that was that was something that i was that was something that that was that I was kind of worried about is that you'd give it to editors who want to put their fingerprints on it and that. And, and really what you're looking for is an editor who can choose the moment and then say, no, I don't have anything to do here. That's my editorial job done. Uh, and uh, that's what you, that's what you were, what I was looking for. Um, and I got it. it. You know, as I say, I came away from that, from that meeting that day and I knew that the book had found its proper home place that was kind of sympathetic and that would bring out the best in it and and then we went through I, I don't know if you've seen I don't know if you've seen the cover I really um, I love the cover it's kind of a thing uh, it became a kind of a thing when it was published because it came out in May it came out in May and there was there was a, a we, we had five or six good sh sunny days and it became a thing on Facebook to take yeah I know summer in Ireland <laughs> <laughs> and it became a thing to bring it out into the it became a thing to bring it out into the uh, to bring it out into the sunlight and to, and to get the you see it on Facebook with people bring it out into the sun getting the sun to reflect of it but one of the one of the things about about working with a small publisher is that they can be attentive to up to a point you know there's budgetary considerations they can, they can be attentive to to the covers that you want and everything like, like I worked with a fine publisher in in um, in New York called Soho Press but they they published uh, three of my books and the last one they published was a piece it was a book called Forensic Songs and uh, it was published by by Lilliput Press in Dublin. Lilliput put a beautiful cover on it, really beautiful edition. And then it went over to America, and they sh they showed me the the the, the cover, and I s they says we think it's very striking. We think it's. <laughs> uh, and I s I said I said, P. Ugly it'd be you know, <laughs> and and um, and no one to this day no one has told me that they like the cover. <laughs> That said, that said, there was a long article in Slate in the summer saying this is the best cover of of the of, of the of the book. So what do I know? But but this one, this one here, the the um, do you remember this discussion that they brought they brought me two covers. Uh, this is these are the covers I think are going with for Solo Bones and and I looked at them and I think oh God I'm not that gone on, on either of them and that. But I said look if this one if we have to go with one of them let's go with this one here. And, um, and Sarah said, look, says we're tram press. We want our writers to be happy. So we can go once more, just once more to the, to the publisher and uh, our, once more to our designer. So the, the, the designer came back with this cover. And I s looked at it and I said, I don't, I've never known the cover. I, I didn't know what the cover of Solar Bones was going to be. But that's it. That's the cover. That's the cover of the book. He says, we're so happy. 
And this is, and see those lines there now, we're going to put gold varnish on them. And I was thinking, oh, Jesus, leave it alone. Leave good enough alone. Isn't it good the way it is? I said, fucking hell, it's, it sounds too bling for me. And, and, but I didn't say, and, then, and yeah, and we're going to, and look, we're going to put this, this purple inside here. And I said, Jesus, isn't white grand? Leave it alone. But they were right on everything they did in it. They were, and the cover became... The cover became one of the one one of the the aspects of the book that that that, uh, that I love as well. So as I say, I lost the I, I completely lost the argument at every other at every other publisher I've been at. I've lost the argument on covers. I've a, I've a published five, ten different editions, and I have two great covers. The very first cover of my of my first book, and this cover for Soul of Bones. Do you, do you get much say at FSG for, the co for your covers? Oh, it, they're always striking. Yeah. That's the word. <laughs> that, I think they learn that in publishing school, that when, when, when you're sending a, a jacket to the author, say, we think this is striking. Yeah. <laughs> because yeah. what does that mean? Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. Know? It's, yeah. Um, yeah, they all think it's striking. And then you say, what? <laughs> there, there was a, I think it's Alison Kennedy has a great story about she sent her book to, New, to FSG in New York, and they sent her back a photograph and, of what they were going to do. And, and it was a, a picture of an apple in a playpen. An apple in a playpen. And she wrote them back, let her never... In my wildest dreams, did I think that my work would be accurately represented by an apple in a playpen? And they wrote back, and this is, we're so glad that you like the cover. <laughs> <laughs> striking, <laughs> yes. Yeah, <that's> striking, yeah. <laughs> I want to talk a little bit about, I mean, if there's ever a novel that um, is not about what it's about, <laughs> it's about so many other things. It's Solar Bones. Um, uh, but Marcus Conway is an engineer. Um, I have two older brothers who are engineers. I have never been in the least bit interested in what they do every day. Um, and they've never been able to make it interesting to anyone at any dinner party that I've been to with them. <laughs> um, but Marcus is an engineer. So in some ways, I think this is my research question. I, I read that you did begin to study engineering when you first went to Galway. You, you took a stab at yeah, it. Yeah, I did for, for a couple of reasons. Um, the main reason really was my, my father died in, uh, in the January of the year, beginning of February of the year of my leaving cert, and this big exam you do at the end of high school. And he died very suddenly uh, in, in, his, in his bed. He was 46, uh, got a heart attack. And he, uh, because of that, I was the oldest in the family. So I, I was going to get a vocational education. I, I had this notion that now I, have a, I was the man of the house. I had a family to look after and everything. So I signed up to do engineering because that was the golden boy of those. In, in the, in the mid-1980s in Ireland, the only people making money were engineers, particularly electronic engineers. So I went to study engineering, and I, I knew within three hours of being in the class that, that I said, I have, you have no aptitude. You're only codding yourself. You have no, no aptitude for it. Didn't have the maths. Didn't have the logical turn of mind. Didn't have absolutely no aptitude for it at all. Um, but I stuck it out until Christmas and left it and that. And then I went home and I got a job and, and I, I, I went back to university and studied philosophy and English and that. But Marcus, but one, uh, when I studied philosophy and English, one of the things I studied was history, of, history and philosophy of technology and about engineers. And um, the more, just the more I realized, like the just so interesting engineers that they, engineers, you know, writers write about the world and painters paint the world and photographers for, photograph the world. But engineers make the world. Engineers make the world. And we in the humanities resent them and despise them for it and that. <laughs> and we give them a hard time. We see them as rude, soulless mechanicals. And that's not my... And it seems to me that, that our... And the stuff that Marcus is involved in, it's not the big pharaonic projects. It's civil engineering. It's roads, houses, drainage, all, the, all, the, all the, the vernacular things, all the day to day stuff and that. And these are the things we value. These are the things we prize. These things are the signature, of, part of the signature of our times, neither more nor less than our poetry and our music and our novels and that. And I wanted to, 
And for that reason, I, I, I came to that conclusion a long, long time ago. And for that reason, there was you know, a sign out in my head saying, engineer wanted. I have work here for an engineer if I can find one. And uh, you know, I, I came to that conclusion in my early 20s. So I've been, been amenable to an engineer for, you know, for 25 years and that. And so he eventually he showed up, and he was Marcus Conway. And he was in his early 50s and that. And he was from around the same place I'm from myself, Lewisburg and Mayo. So I knew slightly. I'd, I'd read engineers, read um, Samuel Florman's work, The Civilized Engineer, and um, the, the Existential Pleasures of Engineering, two brilliant books on engineering. Should be on any kind of list of books that you hand to a, a student at the, going into university and that. A brilliant essayist, um, a great advocate of the, of the the nobility of engineering, a great believer in engineering, and that, and um, and I came across an uh, I came across an architect as as well. Or I came across an engineer as well called Peter Rice. And Rice is I'd reckon Rice is the greatest Irish artist of the late twentieth century. Um, he was twenty six or twenty seven, and his first job as an engineer was to go to Sydney and to put the roof on the Sydney Opera House. That's, that's this engineer. He's the James Joyce of materials. Not, that's what he was known as in the trade. He was the James Joyce, because he could make them do things. He could make, he could make cable behave like, he could make cable behave rigidly. He could make glass float, everything. He could do all sorts of contradictory things. And we walk through his, we walk through his structures, like Stansted Airport, the, the Lloyds building, um, the couple of the galleries in Paris. He's a, he's a real hero in Paris. But I, I saw an interview with him. I seen interviews with him. He worked for Arup. And I saw interviews with him, and I read a bit about him. And he's a really attractive man, a really attractive personality. And he was much more at home speaking to the people in Arup remember him really well. They, and they remember him that he was much more inclined to talk about poetry and theater than he was about engineering and that. And Norman Foster still says, hands down, the greatest engineer I ever worked with was, 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 uh, was Peter Rice. So, his, his, so all of those things came together. And uh, kind of, and, and because no one has ever read a book about an engineer, no one, has read, no one has read a novel about engineers, or engineers are always on the side of eugenics or something like that. They're always doing things for the bad. And I want to this engineer who's doing something for the good. So all of those reasons. And also because they have this, 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 he's a civil engineer. So he stands at this really interesting nexus between politics, public money, private money. And he's always trying to steer. He's always, his job is to look after the common good, the public good. And he's trying to fend off people who want a bite out of it and who want. And it's just a case of just, just how how little, how, how he manages to navigate projects through to their end, which is part of what, what the book is about and that. So the book is a hymn to engineers and engineering. And, uh, and I th possibly think that a lot of what people have liked about the book is, is that suddenly woke up to the notion, yeah, engineers are cool. <laughs> <laughs> but he's also a family man. Um, and uh, family relationships are, are so beautifully drawn. Um, one that um, was pr particularly interesting to me, because not only do I have two older brothers who were in engineers, but I have a daughter who's an artist and a performance artist. Yeah. Um, and Marcus has a daughter who's a performance, performance artist, artist um, yeah. who um, medium is her own blood. Yeah. Um, that's not an obvious choice for a portrait of an engineer in no. in Mayo. Um, no. What what would and what he's would completely be... thrown by that as well himself. Yes. He, uh, he... Wh how did how did that come about in the novel? We're... It, it <laughs> one of the things I've always envied. I, I was a, a student and I studied philosophy and and English and everything like that, and I started writing my first stories in my early twenties. But but. I received the best part of my education was in my 20s, where I shared houses with a succession of painters, sculptors, photographers, um, visual artists. For 10 years straight, I, I, 
those were my intellectual and artistic companions. I didn't meet another writer until I was, until the day I signed my contract with Jonathan Cape. I met the American poet Thomas Lynch, uh, who, who, um, who came up and shook hands to me. And that was the first time I'd met a writer. All through my 20s was spent in the company of visual artists and that. So, and, my, and I went on to, my wife is a, is, um, my wife is a painter. So they were much closer to me uh, in terms of the, the, way they, the way they work, mm -hmm. the difference in the way they go about things, the continual, what I see, is almost the shambles of what they, what they go through and they bring out these beautiful pieces at the other end. And I've always admired and envied them, the tactile relationship that they have with the way they make things, the way they, they, the way they have this involved. I see my own, I see Saul at home and he's, he's been painting since he was three months old on that. And he's, he's, now, he's, he's now way better at it and more familiar at it than I am on that. So that formed a huge part of my, I suppose, my education, my artistic education. And, and it was bound to come out. I never write about writers, but I have, three or four visual artists in my work over four or five books and that. The visual artists have occurred four or five times in, in the work, but never a writer. And, and there's another uh, fascinating element to that for me in the novel. Um, Agnes, uh, Marcus's daughter, is the performance artist who writes uh, in her own blood. Uh, Maride, uh, Marcus's wife, um, becomes very ill in the novel, a uh, sewer-borne yeah. virus. Um, and he becomes her caretaker. So the two women closest to him, the two women in his family, um, it's about flesh and blood and excrement. And, yeah. Um, yeah. and yet his son, Dara, is in Australia for the whole novel, and we only see him on Skype. <laughs> he is um, disembodied face and voice. Yeah. He's very wise uh, for his age. Um, and uh, has wonderful conversations with his fathers, but but he has no body, so to speak, in yeah. the novel. And yet the two women are all about body, body and flesh. Um, how do you see that? That's a recurring. It's a recurring thing in my work about. It's a recurring thing in my work about the body as a as a contested place. The body as a as a as a site of political engagement. I've had it in. I've had it in right from my very first book of short stories. And this is one of those themes that surface in you as a writer. And I don't go around thinking these things at all. I, I go, oh, there's a body now, a contested site when I see a woman <laughs> walking on the street. I do not. I think other thoughts completely. But when you sit down and you start thinking about it, this is the way the body manifests itself. And, it, and, and, in, and, and it, it it was very, very much a theme in Notes from a Coma, but it's such a, it's, it, I think it's a uniquely Irish thing, and I think women's bodies have become such a contested ground in, we're going to see it next Friday, is Friday? No. But we've seen it in things like, uh, I think it passes people by, but I think the hepatitis uh, um, catastrophe, the hepatitis thing, in which 70 or 80 women lost their lives mm -hmm. at the hands of government negligence and mm -hmm. that, uh, at the hands of institutional incompetence and that. The way women's fertility was pushed into, was pushed out of sight and pushed into, was pushed into, into um, institutions and everything like that. And I mean, you telling me that Dorothy McArdle fell, fell, you know, fell out with Eamon de Valera. The, Tram Press have published, are publishing two books by Dorothy McArdle, and Dorothy McArdle was secretary to Eamon de Valera, and she was, uh, she was his, his, his secretary and... His thing, confidant and advisor. Confidant and advisor. Mm -hmm. But she fell out politically with him over the position of the autonomy of women, more mm -hmm. or less. In, in uh, as a lot of you probably know, women are consigned to the home in the latest edition of the Constitution that came out in 1936, and that sort of overrode the constitutions that were written in... 1916 and then again in 1924, yeah. I want to say. Yeah. Um, so women's place is literally enshrined in the home and that and we are meant to be protected there. Um, but of course, this is a very negative thing for women to be, you know, home and looking after the kids instead of being the political, you know, animals that we are. So 
Yeah, um, and as Mike was saying, we're still seeing the effects of this play out. Um, we have a referendum on Friday, as you may know, to find out whether we may legalise abortion at last in Ireland. So repeal the eighth, guys. <laughs> But it's the, the more the immediate instance of what brought it to was that there was there was an outbreak of cryptosporidiosis in cryptosporidium cryptosporidiosis in in Galway in my city, and um, it was it it was in two thousand and seven, um, and all of a sudden a couple of hundred people went down with this awful puking thing. Uh, it's it's an it's it's a bug gets into your belly and it's really it it's it's it. It's dangerous, it's long-lasting, and it's pretty unglamorous as, as an illness and that. And um, it, that was a political event as well. That, that happened because of bad planning laws, bad engineering, no money put into, into the upkeep of the, of the water system, too many, too many houses built, drawn on a limited water supply, all sorts of things. It became a kind of... The difficulty was in not treating it symbolically because everything was built, everything that was wrong with Ireland and was built into that outbreak of cryptosporidiosis that happened in Galway. So that was a kind of a, it's one of those things that was actually was a godsend for a novelist and I was surprised, <laughs> I was surprised someone else hadn't, got, hadn't jumped on it before me and that. But um, I, I actually saw it, it's, it's, you think, it, and it was embarrassing, it was a, civ, it was a civic embarrassment as well. You know, it was, it was, um, you think, I, I, like Galway is the wettest town in the world. You think we'd be able to get the water right in it, but we weren't in that. There's still, there's still actual, there's still actual, you, you, you there's still actually, there's outbreaks of cryptosporidium in, in, uh, in, um, in Mayo, there was an outbreak in it the week the book was published. Someone says that that oh, nice. is the best publicity <laughs> thing I've ever seen for a book. We, we jumped on it, yeah. yeah. Um, no, these things still happen a lot, though. And I, I think this is more sort of an organizational rather than an engineering issue. But we're just finding out at home that um, the, the test that you're supposed to see to make sure that you're not developing breast cancer um, or ovarian cancer, rather, um, there have been huge failures in that system, so women are only finding out now that they, you know, the last th th few smear tests have been normal, but they've actually got stage four cancer and women are dying. So these things happen all the time, and I don't know why, but it always seems to be the women that are the yeah. the ones to pay for it. It, it. Invariably, invariably, it is. Men's bodies are totally neglected. You, you just put spuds and pour through into them, and off they go, and that they're grand. <laughs> Women's bodies are much more politicised in, in, in much more politicised. Well, a good reason to, yeah. to send Marcus's son um, around the world and, and keep and him he on was, the screen. Uh, one of the things, one of the things about about the book, and one or two people have drawn attention to that about how how the women are so fleshly in it and that and. Um, I think Marcus, Marcus envies the women in his life. They seem, for all their, for all their, the, their, the kind of uh, bloodletting and so on and that, they're much more at home in the world than he is. He's much more, he's not half as, and for all his brilliance, uh, Dara in Australia is, is, it will never, it seems to me, put his mind down to anything because he's got loads of gifts, but he just can't settle on anything of like that. I remember one one of the things that and just, just talking to you, uh, Alice. But I was I was the book is about this, that, and the next thing. But but I was I was in I was in Waterstones in London the year after it was published, and I was giving a I was giving a, a talk on it and that. And a, a woman in the front in the audience says, she says, I, I, she says, you know, it's now by now a commonplace that the book is about so many things. But she says, for me, she says, it's a book about faith. She said, it's a, book about, it's a book about how one man turned his back on God and took up family and engineering and that. And that she says, and what's at issue in the book is that he's worried that the faith of his father isn't going to be, he's worried that his daughter and his son are not going to take on the faith of their father, that they're not going to go with family, community, and engineering, the same oh. thing that he is. And she had this long 10 minute riff on this thing. Mm -hmm. I turned to the fellow, I says, you should ask her about the book. She knows way more about it. <laughs> but no, I, I, she was just brilliant to listen to, but it was, and, and it does, it, and she, what's his name? And it is, it is, I think, I think Dara points that out to Marcus at some stage. She says, you, he says, you turned, your, you turned from the cross and you took up a theodolite mm -hmm. and that, and uh, mm -hmm. you know, he talks about the, the crosshairs and the theodolite that mm -hmm. they're, a cross of a different sort than that.
I thought it was a bit fanciful myself, but then it is Dara <laughs> that's speaking. <laughs> Uh, when I was in uh, Ireland in March, uh, a woman in Dublin um, who identified herself as, a, as an Irish writer said to me that she very purposely makes sure that all her characters are secular um, because you can't write about Catholic, faithful, contemporary people in Irish fiction. She said, we've had enough of that. Um, were you aware of that? I mean. Um, Marcus does not accept the faith of his father, um, and um, and since we do see him at the hour of his death, yeah. um, there's no conversion. <laughs> yeah, and he, I, don't, I, I don't know what I don't, don't really know what happens in those closing pages. It, he, he kind of calls out to his God, and I don't know if God ever meets him. Um, I remember being reading a a, 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 sh a thing in the Creed, an essay, a long essay on the Creed. And there is a the, there is a tradition in the creed where where and there's a tradition in faith about if we go looking for God and God sees him look God sees us looking for him he'll meet us halfway um, if we don't go looking for him at all he's not bothered with us but if we if we make a first step towards us for every step we make towards him he'll make a step towards us and that I don't know if there's something of that in those closing pages and that um, but um, but. Marcus is, is particularly susceptible to astonishment. And um, he remarks on it that, that it's incredible that I am here as I am at this moment. The odds against it are so hopelessly stacked against it and that. And he took, he took God to be this, he took God to be the shape of his astonishment or took God to be the source of his astonishment and went pursuing that and God, God God gave him the back of his hand. God told him to cop on to yourself and go away and uh, go out and live another life. Oh, I don't know life. about he, that. He, he did he, bring him back. Yeah, yeah. He did bring him back. He does show up in the kitchen again. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah. That's a, that, uh, that's God actually, or the author, I'm yeah. not sure. <laughs> so, he's, so that was all of those things fed into those considerations. It's set on, it's set on All Souls Day, which is the 2nd of November, and... Um, it's built around a, a, a piece of folklore from my part of the world, from Mayo. <laughs> There's a part from Galway as well, which... which uh, the story in Mayo is that on All Souls Day, the dead, the faithful department, can return to their home. Uh, and uh, they can return to their home, and they leave out food and drink for them, for them and that. And, um, and in Galway, though, they have a, they have a meaner telling of the same story. <laughs> The dead can return, but they don't want them to return because the dead have come a long way and they're hungry and they could eat you out of house and home. <laughs> <laughs> and they, they literally disguise the houses and they leave the houses so that they, and they don't leave out any food for them because <laughs> they could literally eat you out of house and don't home. Answer don't answer the door. Don't answer the door, yeah. And, uh, so I like the word, you know, I'm from Mayo, so I, I always think it's something typical of Galway. There's this mean spirit about them. <laughs> that, but in Mayo, they have this generosity about them that, of course, we'd be on, we'd be on, we'd, we, would be, we would be on good terms with the dead. Well, we're all very lucky that Marcus was allowed in. <laughs> we have time for questions. Um, there are microphones. Um, if you have a question, and grab a mic. Uh, you alluded to it in your discussion, but there was an article about a month ago in the Irish Times about how it's a golden era for Irish writers. Um, would you care to comment on that? What What is the inspiration for that? Is it the, the Celtic Tiger to the Celtic Garfield? Um, but yeah. I, I, um, I'll, I'll speak on it for a moment. It's just basically to... To repeat and turn the question over to, to Sarah, but I, I think it's a coming together of it's a coming together of, of two things. That, like this, you know, we're looking we're lucky to have have a great. Um, at the moment, we have a very good uh, culture of magazines and journals out there that are very good at nurturing talent. They bring writers back. They. They say, yeah, good, but not quite good enough if you make these changes. And I've seen, I've known people like Declan to return manuscripts to younger writers with, with a come on rather than a rejection on it and that. And, and so there's this kind of symbiotic relationship between writers and magazines out there at the moment now. And, and, um, and English publishers 
are standing back actually and they are letting Irish publishers publish first and then they come in and they then they come in and they take that they buy up the books that because it, we need the some of us need English publishers and that because Irish publishers it's a small constituency and you're not going to make make a full living on it and that but uh, so it's 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 a combination of genuine talent genuine writerly talent and a willingness to explore plus a generation of editors willing to foster that adventurous spirit and that because there's nothing if you go to sell, try selling your books to britain there's nothing worse than than trying to sell an experimental novel to a british publisher you're just banging your forehead against the wall it's no it's not going to work for you and and ireland has the great ireland is really unique we our great writers are our experimental writers exclusively there's no other there's no uh, flan o'brien Joyce, Flann O'Brien, and Beckett. That's our Mount Rushmore. <laughs> and they, and they, those, and they, they have nothing in common between them except the fact that they went to some great bother to extend the received form and to broaden out the received form and that. And it's in that spirit, I think, that, that I'd like to think that the younger generation are writing. For my part, I have a big problem with UK publishers coming in and buying out Irish talent once it's been shown to be successful, once other people have proved that it's good. That's not good for our writing community. Um, so one thing that Trump does is it's we're very ambitious. We have excellent networks in the UK. We sell just as well over there as any UK-based small publisher would. Um, but I think certainly historically there has been a sort of lack of ambition there. Um, and I think it's just, it's really important to to have an international publisher that is based in Dublin. Um, as Mike says, we've got, what, four Nobel laureates, four Irish Nobel laureates for literature, and not a single Faber or Edition Gallimard or um, Grove Atlantic. And so I think it's really important that publishers just, you know, are ballsier and look outward. Um, with regard to, yeah, the, the writers that are in Ireland at the moment, I mean, Irish writers have always been brilliant. Um, I don't know why that is. But what worries me about um, articles saying, oh, look what's going on in Ireland right now is if Irish writing is in vogue one day, I worry that it's going to be out of vogue the next. And that can be difficult for Irish writers too. So, uh, yeah, just long may it continue, I guess. I have a question. Um, concerning the, 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 the style of the book, the narration, which is astonishing and remarkable. Um, I read the book three times. I found myself uh, reading it sometimes to let it wash over me, because it does that beautifully. Uh, but then also just slowing down and, and, and savoring. But it's, it's a prose that is, is much more akin to poetry. And I'm wondering at what point in the process you you hit upon this, and whether you had doubt uh, going forward with it, pushing it to the limit, or whether you just said this is what it is. I'm sticking with it. I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna carry it out to its end. It's, it's interesting you say it's interesting you say that it's more akin to poetry. A, a, a poet Louis de Puer comes up to me. He says, "Go on." He says, "Admit it." It's a poem, isn't it? Go on, admit it. And he says, "You just won't admit. You just can't admit it, can you?" Because <laughs> uh, I would, I would, I would. Uh, um, I, I, my own belief is that my own belief is that it's actually a song. Uh, is that it's much closer to being. He says it himself that it's a post-mortem aria, um, a song of praise, uh, and that. And I, I think it's. I think it's. It's a song to span heaven and earth. I think it's it's as it's as it's as coherent if you take it at that. But the the question you ask about very quickly, very early in the composition of the book, I knew it was I knew the type of being that was speaking, uh, not just an engineer but a dead engineer. Uh, it was a ghost, and it seemed to me to be the most obvious thing in the world is that a ghost would have nothing to do with full stops, okay? Because ghosts would ghosts would hanker after continuance and ongoingness and that, okay? And when I made this realization, it drew me back to an experiment that I'd conducted for over two or three years. I was I was writer in residence in New York, Galway, and one of the first things I did every day came in was I just started writing, and I could write about anything, but there was only two rules, and the first rule was that it had to transition smoothly from whatever it is I I laid I I'd wrote the day before, and secondly, it there would be no full stop. Because I was just interested in maintaining an ongoing 
rhythm, rolling cadences and things like that. It was kind of very heavily reading 19, I was very reading 19th century writers at the time, people like Thomas Carlyle, who, who built up these sentences of rolling cadences and yeah, and repetitions and everything like that. And uh, so is that possible? And so I, when, when I made that realization that Marcus was a ghost in that, I remembered this experiment. And I have this experiment I conducted, it now bulks to about 500 pages, something like that. And it's 500 pages of nonsense, but it is continuous rhythmic nonsense in that, okay? And that was, uh, that was, so Marcus being the being that he is, a ghost, it renewed that experiment and I drew on the, drew on those three years of kind of rhythmic training in many ways that, that I had laid down. And did I give it any, did I give it any, was I worried by it? Not really, I don't know, just, just I should have been. Um, and I possibly just, I don't know, I was, just def I, was glad I, I was glad that I didn't succumb to fear or worry in it or anything like that. Um, you know, there, I wrote it during years that were tough years in some ways where I didn't have a publisher and that, but my wife used to always say to me, she says, you know, publishing isn't your job. Your job is to write. Just keep writing and that. So that's what I kept doing. There's a couple of passages. I mean, uh, Marcus is very worried about, as an engineer, about failures, about the failure of a foundation, about chaos. Things collapsing. Things yeah. collapsing, things falling apart. I mean, you can feel that anxiety. As a ch He has a memory of it as being a child and seeing his father took Just, a tractor apart yeah. and spread, and, and that filled him with anxiety. And, and reading that as a writer, yeah. I thought that's notes to myself. <laughs> that's 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 the author saying. Yeah. Um, I don't want to worry about this falling apart, so I'll let my character worry about it. But yeah. Did you have that sense of I, keep it going? Yeah. There was just yeah, and I was it was it was um, I was I think when the book p picks up and when it has a heartbeat and that and when it goes on, I think that's when it's at its best, and then you just. Try and get out. It's not so much a case of writing it as just trying to get out of its way and let it have its way and that and, and uh, not interfere with it at all in so little, uh, as little as possible. Your that. fears at bay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Don't start second guessing yourself. Just go with it, yeah. Do we have another question? Janet? Hi. Uh, the title, Solar Bones, um, I think it's a passage about 50 pages into the book where he talks about, he, he's at the kitchen window, uh, it's about 7 o'clock in the morning, and he remarks upon the fact that he, the car is passing the road, he knows who they are, he knows where they're going, he knows that at a certain time in the evening they're going to be returning the same way, he knows that they're going to be at home listening to the death notices, they're going to come in later on at points and, and into the town. And it's about the cycles and the, the, what he terms the rites, the rhythms, and the rituals of a small community, which are tied to the sun, which are temporal rhythms, which are solar, the solar bones which uphold this community. He's a, he's a more vivid telling of it now than I have there. But solar bones, these, these temporal structures which uphold uh, a community, and not as a rigid thing, but as an ongoing repeating cycle or an ongoing rising cycle or something like that. So that's the, the idea of solar bones. Thank you. Thank you for this beautiful book. Thank you, Sarah, for bringing it to us. Thank you. Thank you all for being here tonight. Thanks so much. Thanks so much.